Hello and welcome to our online service. It's really good uh, for you to join us today. My name is Nathan and I'm a chaplain at St Paul's Church Tavern. As we begin our worship, let's just take a brief moment to be still, to remember who we've come to worship and adore and to receive from this morning. And then throughout the service, if you could join in with any words that come on the screen in yellow. So let's be still and then we'll pray an opening prayer together. We pray together. Almighty and gracious God, it is a privilege to worship you this day in this community. May our praise be joyful. May our hearts be turned towards you and may our souls be quenched with the waters of your word. We give you all glory and praise and gratitude this day and forever. Amen. As you'll be aware by now, we are each week working our way through Matthew's Gospel. We're going to hear a reading from Matthew now. And as we listen to this, may it prepare us for confession which will follow. This passage is about prayer, it's about attitude, but ultimate, uh, about giving, but ultimately it's about the attitude of our hearts, what lies behind those things that we do. So let's listen to this reading and then we'll move straight into confession. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew chapter 6 verses 1 to 15. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on streets to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. 
but when you give to the needy do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you and when you pray do not be like hypocrites for they love to pray standing in synagogues and on street corners to be seen by others truly i tell you they have received their reward in full but when you pray go into your room close the door and pray to your father who is unseen then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you and when you pray do not keep on babbling like pagans for they think they will be heard because of their many words do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask him this then is how you should pray our father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one for if you forgive other people when they sin against you your heavenly father will also forgive you but if you do not forgive others their sins your father will not forgive your sins this is the word of the lord thanks to be to god lord god our maker and our redeemer this is your world and we are your people come among us and save us we have willfully misused your gifts of creation lord be merciful forgive us our sin we have seen the ill treatment of others and have not gone to their aid lord be merciful forgive us our sin we have condoned evil and dishonesty and failed to strive for justice lord be merciful forgive us our sin we have heard the good news of christ but have failed to share it with others lord be merciful forgive us our sin we have not loved you with our whole heart nor our neighbors as ourselves lord be merciful forgive us our sin May God, who loved the world so much that he sent his Son to be our Saviour, forgive us our sin and make us holy to serve him in the world, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
she's in for beauty and where forgiveness like a crown coming to kiss the feet of mercy I lay every burden down at the foot of the cross The reading is taken from the book of Philippians chapter 3 verses 8 to 14 what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so, somehow, attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do Forgetting what is behind and straining f towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. So this morning from Philippians, the message is to keep going, keep our eyes, just like last week, fixed on Jesus. Our, our goal, our calling onwards, that, that heavenly calling to keep on going, fixing, fixing our eyes on Jesus. It is, it's weary and tiresome, isn't it, at the moment, this, this COVID business. Even now as I record, I don't really know what, what Sunday will bring for our gathered worship. Uh, there's rumours that we'll only be able to meet us 40 people. We're hoping for 70. We don't know where that will be. But, it's, but in our day-to-day -day lives, just thinking about, can I see this person? Can I not see this person when you're at work? What are our protocols? What should we be doing? Should we be working from home? Uh, what am I allowed to do? Um, same with, with sports clubs and activities for our children. Whatever it is, it's just lots and lots of thinking and second guessing. Kind of, never mind kind of our own health situations or being longing to see our own family members. Well, I can see them, well, I put people at risk. It's weary and it's tiresome. But I want to ask you in the midst of all this, in the middle of all this thinking that we are having to do, where is your faith? Where's your relationship with Jesus at? No matter what's happening around us, let us fix our eyes on him and, and look for that prize that heavenly calling Jesus is our prize. Let's, let's keep on going. Through the Bible, there are constant reminders, just like we had last week, to keeping our eyes fixed and focused on God. The Psalms, again, time and time call us to, to look up to the hills or look to God, lift our hearts, lift our voices to God, lift our eyes to God. If you think about the account where Peter is walking on the water because he sees Jesus walking on the water, he says, if, if Jesus is doing it, then, then call me and I'll come to you. And he does and he steps out onto the water. And then he suddenly is aware of all that's going on around him. And he takes his eyes off Jesus and he focuses on the wind and the waves and he begins to sink. That is a, a constant refrain through scripture, isn't it? To, to keep our eyes on Jesus, to not get distracted by all that's going on about us. Not that we ignore it. Of course, Peter had to be aware of the waves around. Of course, we have to, we can't ignore the situation with COVID or situations with our families, whatever it is. There's lots more going on than COVID in people's lives. We don't ignore them, but keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. Like it said in Philippians, I press on towards a goal. So this morning, how is your pressing on? Is that something that you, you feel you are doing or are you drifting? Are you you've been distracted? Are we kind of just looking at the, the waves around us and not being single-minded, just like Paul uh, was for himself and encourage us to be and on our gaze and fix on Jesus? We are, we are almost coming to the end of a sermon series looking at why church. And this week, it's quite simple, because of Jesus. That's, that's why church. 
uh, in some senses the other weeks have kind of weaved around this topic kind of it's been assumed that that's the reason but this week explicitly laying out why church because of Jesus nowhere else or very few other places will there be a constant reminder and encouragement to keep on going to keep on looking at Jesus you may have a brilliant boss at work but it's not really unless they're a follower of Jesus themselves it's not really in their mindset to encourage you uh, to keep on focus on Jesus it's just not going to happen in our friendships groups in our in our social groups in in um, sports clubs or whatever it is people aren't there to try and help you to fix your eyes on Jesus why church because we're gathered around a whole bunch of people who will encourage us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus in, in two weeks time Patrick Lambert will be looking at a great passage from Hebrews about the great cloud of witnesses spurring us on but this morning, I'm simply going to call us and encourage us, hopefully, to keep our eyes on Jesus. Why should we have our eyes fixed on Jesus? Well, there's, there's many reasons. But in this passage today from Philippians, it just shows time and time again that Jesus satisfies. That's why. Jesus satisfies our deepest needs, our longest. Jesus is there and keeping fixed on him, pressing on towards the goal. Jesus satisfied. Being satisfied isn't necessarily always seen as a great thing. You know, if you, if you do a piece of work for school or whatever it is, and someone in Mark comes back, oh, that's satisfactory. It kind of means you've kind of done what I've asked you to do, but it wasn't great. You know, if, if the word satisfactory or satisfied can sometimes just mean kind of, yeah, just about hit the mark, but not, not brilliantly. But when we talk about Jesus satisfying, it's... I'm kind of thinking about after a great meal and afterwards you just lean back and you're, oh, I am satisfied. Not one of those, those posh meals that might have tasted delicious but leaves you thinking, oh, where's, where's the rest of my food? When's that going to come? I mean, kind of a satisfied, like that deep longing that you kind of, you're nicely filled, not too full. It was tasty, it was good and good company. Oh, I am satisfied. In fact, in Luke's Gospel, I think it's Luke's Gospel, where Jesus feeds the 5,000, at the end it tells us that the crowd there, they were satisfied. They weren't kind of going, oh, that was all right, where's my next meal? They were contented. They had had their fill. They were satisfied. Jesus satisfied. And verses 8 and the, just the beginning of verse 9 shows that satisfaction is found in Jesus. What is more? Paul writes, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. By many standards, Paul, who is writing this letter, had had a life that was great before he met Christ. He was known as Saul, if you remember. He was well respected, a Jewish leader. He was known for his zeal for God and upholding the law. He was famous for his pursuit of those blaspheming Christians. So he had social standing. He had recognition, he had respect, he had power, he had authority. And we don't know about his financial situation, but we assume with all those kind of things, there would have been financial security as well. By the world standards, by the eyes, by his own standards, Paul was someone who you might say had made it in life. Someone that other people looked to and went, wow, I wish my life could look like that. I wish I had what Saul, as he was known then, had. But Paul says that actually all that, you know, at the time I thought it was brilliant, but now because of Christ, I consider it garbage. Just a load of rubbish compared to the satisfaction that I now have in Jesus. You know, I, I felt like I lost those things, but that loss was good compared to what I have now gained in Jesus and been found in him. We kind of take Jesus sometimes for granted don't we I, I know I certainly do 
I consider myself fortunate that, that I grew up uh, in, in, a, in a family where going to church and knowing Jesus was part of the rhythm of our life. So there's probably not been a time in my life where I've not known Jesus. I've always known him. Of course, there was a time where I decided that he wanted to be, that I wanted to make Jesus my Lord and I wanted to follow him for myself. But I'm thankful that I've always known Jesus. My life, therefore, has kind of been shaped by him. But many of you and many of the people I speak to have came to faith in Jesus at a later stage can echo these words of Paul that actually life before at the time felt great perhaps. You know, maybe they had all the things or they're pursuing the right things. But now that they've found Jesus, now that they are found in Jesus, there's a whole new level of satisfaction and contentedness. Paul says, I consider it all garbage compared now to knowing Jesus. Jesus satisfies. We also have the satisfaction of being blessed by Jesus. In verse 9, Paul talks about righteousness. He talks about righteousness that he has achieved that comes from following the law. And, and he talks about righteousness that has come through Jesus. The first righteousness is like a certificate of good behaviour. It kind of, it's good, it's worthwhile, but, but ultimately it's not what Paul needs. If you think about someone in prison, and uh, we see this in the films all the time, um, you know, and they're up for parole. And there's the questions of kind of, have they behaved themselves in prison? Like, have they had that certificate of good conduct? In this case, where Paul's talking about the righteousness that comes from himself, from following the law. Can the wardens or whoever it is that makes the decision look and go, you have behaved yourself. Yes, you've got a certificate of good behaviour. But then there is the, the another question, the bigger question. Have they served the time? Have they paid the punishment that is worthy of the crime they committed? Have they spent enough time in jail? Have they paid the price for the crime that put them there in the first place? If the sense is they haven't, then no matter how good their certificate of good conduct is, if they've not fully paid that price it's felt, then they won't be released on parole. They have to continue and do more time in prison. I don't know if that's helpful, but for me that's kind of helpful to understand what Paul is talking about here. It's kind of a righteousness that comes from himself, from following the law. A certificate of good conduct means it's not perfect, but ultimately... Um, he, he isn't free until the price has been paid for his crimes, for his sins. And he knows that that can only be achieved now by Jesus. Because of Jesus' death on the cross, because of his resurrection, Jesus took on all of our sins and rising in defeated them and defeated death. Therefore, actually, the penalty has been paid, not by us, but by Jesus we get satisfaction in receiving that blessing from Jesus. You know, the, our good conduct, our following our law, our striving can only get us so far, but it never ultimately pays the, pays the price like Jesus has done for us. We have a deep satisfaction that we need not to worry about how we're going to fulfil that because Jesus has done it for us. It is dealt with. So Jesus satisfied, we have satisfaction from Jesus' blessing on our life and there's satisfaction also in, in knowing Jesus. The good news of the gospel isn't just that we were, were given Christ's righteousness and therefore saved uh, and made right with God, that's righteousness made right with God, although that in itself is incredible, but there is more to the gospel than that. It's also about being transformed and this transformation comes through knowing Jesus, which again is, a, is such a huge privilege, satisfaction in just knowing Jesus, satisfaction in knowing God. You know, it wasn't necessary for our salvation for, for us to, to have a relationship with God. Jesus' death on the cross and the resurrection sorted all that out for us. But the purpose of his death and resurrection was so that we could have a relationship with God. That was God's heart. That was God's longing. And because of what Jesus has done, we can have the satisfaction 
of knowing God. Just think about that for a moment. You know, think about you know the, the the scale of God as best we can. Just think about the scale of what He's created, the universe, the galaxy, the millions and billions of, of stars that He made. The vastness and the hugeness. And yet despite that grandeur, that magnificence, we also know that God cares intimately about us, about you and about me. There is a satisfaction in knowing this holy, amazing God. To know Christ, to know God, and not just know about him. We get to have a relationship with God, and that relationship leads to transformation. We get to know the power of Jesus, that Paul says. I, I, I know, or I long to know the power of Jesus. Not just know about it, but know his power within us. We also get to know Jesus, his sufferings. What it cost him for all this to be possible. In the previous chapter of Philippians and Philippians 2, you may know that kind of really well-known passage uh, that describes, it was a hymn of the early church, that describes Jesus' descent uh, to earth and then his ascension back up to heaven. Jesus, who being very nature, uh, God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing by becoming man and becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. That one, I've missed a, a few verses out from that. But hopefully that reminds you. Therefore, God, uh, he ascended into heaven and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. We get this picture of Jesus' journey from heaven, the glory of heaven, to death on the cross and then ascending back up into heaven. And Paul says here, we... We get to, to participate in that. And that the end of that part is great. Yes, we get to share in Christ's glory and his blessings. And we know that one day we will be with Jesus in heaven. Amazing. But there's this kind of sting here, isn't it? That we also share and participate in Christ's suffering. And it's amazing. Actually, in those hard times, in the sufferings, in the challenging, in the persecution, whatever it may be, I believe actually that's where, that's where, where God really gets to work in our hearts, where that transformation uh, really takes place in us. And also, that is also where the privilege of knowing God, of knowing Jesus, the satisfaction really comes through, you know, in the pit in those hard places, knowing that, that Jesus lifts us up. What satisfaction there is in knowing Jesus and joining in the resurrection. And all that far outweighs the struggles that we have. Satisfaction is found in Jesus. Everything else is garbage compared to knowing Jesus. Satisfaction in being blessed by Jesus, the righteousness that he gives us and satisfaction in knowing Jesus, being transformed by him. Incredible stuff. But there is a reality check. In verses 12 and 13, there's a reality check. Just in case we're carried away, just in case we, we kind of feel that we can attain our own perfection, things on our own, Paul reminds us that he has not achieved this for himself. He's not there yet. You know, the, the participating in Christ's death, in participating in his resurrection, knowing God, knowing his power, he longs for it, but he knows he's not fully there yet. Just so we, we don't kind of slacken off, so we don't just kind of take life for granted, so we don't go into cruise control, there is more to have in Jesus. And therefore Paul says, I press on towards the goal. I, I reach, I keep going, I stretch to pursue Jesus, that heavenly calling that he's put on my life. Being aware of our, our shortcomings therefore should help us to strive for Jesus because Jesus has done great things for us. Being aware of his shortcomings, being aware of his failures doesn't mean that, that he gives up, that he, he quits but actually it makes him push on even more. It says, forgetting what is behind. 
I press on, I strive forward to win the prize which Christ has called me heavenwards, forgetting what is behind. That doesn't mean like he forgets everything um, that's happened in the past because I'm sure he holds on to God's mercies that have happened in his life and throughout the, the story of God's people. All those mercies he holds on to remembers. But the stuff that has distracted him, the stuff that has weighed him down, the stuff that has meant that he's not fixed his eyes on Jesus, he knows his sin. He can forget them because they've been dealt with. So he doesn't worry about them. They've happened. They've been dealt with, but he presses on now towards Jesus, forgetting what is behind him, not letting it knock him off course, allowing him to pursue the goal for which Christ has called him heavenward. Because Jesus has something greater for him and for us. We don't actually know what the goal is. You know, he talks about this goal, but doesn't articulate specifically what it is. And, and sometimes I think by kind of just leaving that hanging in the air makes it a bit more mysterious, a bit more alluring as well without pinning it down. Maybe if he articulated it, he, maybe he didn't even feel like he could articulate what the goal is that we are to pursue because it's so incredible. Nevertheless, I've, I've kind of got some ponderings of what it might be just to help us. I, I wonder whether that goal um, taken from scripture, there's several images, could be one that we find in Luke 19. And it's that, that well done, good and faithful servant that God the Father will say to us if we pursue him and follow him and stay in step with him. Maybe from 2 Timothy 4, it's the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Maybe Paul is thinking about the unfading crown of glory from 1 Peter 5. Maybe he's thinking of Revelation 22, where it says that we will see Jesus face to face. Maybe that's his goal. Or maybe it's from 1 Corinthians 2, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. Maybe that's his goal, just having his eyes opened and his heart opened to things that we can't even conceive. Maybe that's his goal. Just kind of a, a handful of incredible things that we are called to in Jesus, that, that are given to us, that await us. Maybe they're his goal. And I'm sure there's a whole load of other things as well. So today, as I hold up Jesus to you, the one who truly satisfies like nothing else can satisfy, like no one else, who Jesus who satisfies because we've got the blessings of Jesus. Jesus satisfies because by knowing him, we are transformed. I encourage us like Paul, to fix our eyes on the goal. Not ignoring what's going on around us, but in the middle of the storm, in the middle of the waves, we fix our eyes on Jesus, pursuing the goal, keeping our eyes and our hearts on him, because Jesus satisfies.
Till the stone was moved for good By the Lamb that conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who'd come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was born Then the Spirit lit the flame Now this gospel truth of all Shall not kneel and shall not faint Like a spotted in His name In His freedom I am free For the love of Jesus Christ Who has resurrected me Thank you for your unfailing love to us, the grace you shower us with and the mercy which is new every morning. We praise you for your unfailing goodness, your inexhaustible love for all your creation and the truth that we can always trust. We thank you for bringing us all safely to a new day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we thank you for the joy of the licensing service for Dominic last week and for the decisions taken at the ACM. We pray for Dominic and Nathan as they lead us. Give them wisdom to discern your will in all these difficulties and challenges that we face at the moment. We thank you for all those you've raised up to serve as wardens and on the council. Give them each a servant heart and help us all to support and encourage them as they carry out their roles in the coming months. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we thank you for calling us to live in Belgium, where we can meet without fear of persecution and we, where we can freely proclaim Jesus is Lord. We pray that we will be salt and light as you command us to be and to hold out hope and compassion to our society here at this time of fear, of fatigue and of hopelessness. We pray that this pandemic will be brought under control. We pray for the medical staff and all those who work in care homes. Keep them safe and give them strength to continue ministering day by day. And we pray for those who are lonely as the restrictions are stepped up. Help them to be reached by neighbours and friends and family. And may they know you, the one who's promised never to leave us or to forsake us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we remember our brothers and sisters around the world who are suffering at this time. We cry out to you with them that they will not be stopped from receiving food or other assistance simply because they own your name. We pray especially for your church in Laos, India, Burma and Vietnam, and that those distributing aid there will act justly and not corruptly. We also pray for protection on those who minister faithfully to the gospel in the face of oppressive regimes. We lift up your children in Hong Kong, in China and Iran, and pray that they will know your protection, love and wisdom in the face of their oppressors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Father, who gave Jesus to be our peace, we ask that you will bring peace to our world, where wars are a way of life with little hope. We pray that the fighting stops in Yemen, in Libya and in Nagorno-Karabakh. We pray especially for Nigeria. We pray that you will intervene and that the army will stop shooting on protesters. 
We pray for the citizens there, that you will keep them safe. Especially we lift up Timothy, that you'll protect his family and his business there. We pray also that the government listens and acts on demands for a security force that protects rather than attacks its people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now let us join in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We've nearly come to the end of our service. And again, thank you for worshipping with us. Just to let you know that in the next few weeks, uh, our intention is to, to move from this pre-recorded format uh, to a live stream from our, our service that takes place in, in Diesburg. Uh, we hope that through that, you'll get a, a greater sense of being part of the wider community as you kind of get to participate in the Sunday worship and, and kind of get the view as if you're in the congregation. Of course, it means we lose this intimacy in a sense because uh, we won't be this close to the camera and talking straight down the lens. But we hope that you'll kind of feel part of, of the wider church community. Next week, then, is our plan to be our, our last pre-recorded. Then after that, um, we're hoping... To, to live stream from Diceberg. That means that it won't be available before 10.30 on a Sunday morning. You can join in at 10.30 with everybody else, but also it'll be available in the same places uh, from there for the rest of the week. We will give you details about how you can log on. It'll be very similar, if not the same, to how you're doing that now. Um, so just watch your emails, watch social media, and we'll keep you posted. But next week, as normal, then we're hoping from the 8th of November that we'll begin our live streaming. As we close our service now, let's pray together before we sing our final song of worship. Heavenly Father, thank you that I am your child. I want to run the race that you have set before me. Help me to press on towards the goal of my calling in Christ Jesus, trusting in him to overcome every problem, disappointment and challenge I may face. To your praise and glory. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.